Let me this afternoon first thank the Chancellor and the Commencement Committee for giving me this rare privilege and thank all of you for agreeing to listen this afternoon. Second, congratulations to the graduating students. What a really wonderful, almost unbelievable day for you and your families who surround you. I'd like to start out by reiterating that with a really big round of applause. Uh, So now you are asking, and rightly asking, okay, how long will this guy talk? That, that's a very fair question. So let me offer some perspective. The longest speech in commencement history was at Harvard, given in English, Greek, and Latin over six hours. And, and at the end of the speech, there was an exam for the graduating students. I will speak only in English, uh, which is helpful, and this will be brief. As I begin this afternoon, I have two emotions tremendous excitement for the students, and personal anxiety. Why should I be anxious about speaking to you? Because this is not just another lecture, as all of us in academics give so many lectures. This is the commencement address for the UNC class of 2012. It's a truly important moment for me personally and for the people who are willing to listen. The only purpose of a commencement speech is to give life advice. The unique challenge is to say something, say anything meaningful. In preparation for this speech, given that I was anxious, I met with a group of students who graduated from several different universities only last May. This was an eye-opening meeting. For the most part, the student could not remember the commencement speaker's name, they could not remember the topic of the speech, and they remembered no advice. This, as I thought about this, I was hoping, and I, to some extent I hope, that this represents some memory loss resulting from the great parties the night before graduation, which I sincerely hope all of you enjoyed. But I am determined to say something memorable. So to prepare for this address, I looked for something memorable in other people's commencement speeches. That seemed reasonable to me. For example, in, her t in 2009, the wonderful singer Dolly Parton spoke to the graduating class of the University of Tennessee. She offered a quite unusual explanation for her success. She attributed her success entirely to big wigs and very firm support. This, this, this is obviously memorable, and it's certainly relevant to me, the big wig part. Um, I really appreciated that comment, and I'm told that I don't have to wear the hat, so I'll just, just get rid of the hat right now. But it's memorable, but it's not particularly relevant. So I looked for other uh, memorable advice. The comedian Ellen DeGeneres gave a speech that I thought might be relevant. UNC graduation is in part so special because of our absolute commitment in this town to Carolina Blue. The fire engines are blue, the, the hydrants are blue, and all of you are wearing your, uh, all of you in the undergraduate rows are wearing uh, wonderful blue robes. The other graduating classes and other universities wear oh so depressing black, but you create an absolute sea of blue. But speaking at the Tulane graduation in 2009, Ms. DeGeneres noted, I cannot think of a more courageous graduating class than you. Look at you all wearing your robes. Where I come from, Hollywood, when you're wearing a robe at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you've already given up on your life. <laughs> so, so looking at these other speeches, some of which were quite exceptional and remarkable, I, I realized I had to focus on my own life, and I needed to, to really focus on the reason I was asked to speak today. I am an infectious disease doctor and researcher working on AIDS. In 2011, my research team made a discovery that gained great attention. We were able to show that the life-saving drugs that we used to treat people with HIV and AIDS could stop the transmission of the virus from one person to another person. Scientists have been talking for years about whether treating HIV infection could stop the epidemic. Our results provided the first real proof. So I want to tell you, to use my time this afternoon, to tell you the story of how all this happened and to tell you what I learned that I think might be memorable to the graduates today. I will share four lessons, and to make it very easy, each lesson will begin with the letter T. For the graduates today, their education, many of them may well have begun their education by watching the television show Sesame Street. I know Elmo and Big Bird have had some real trouble this year. I'm not gonna go into that this afternoon. 
But as you think about Sesame Street, I want to announce officially that this commencement address will be brought to you by the letter T. <laughs> so my first lesson is about timing and taking chances, timing and taking chances. In 1979, 33 years ago, I was a young physician at Yale, uh, working at Yale, and my wife, Gail, who's over there, my wife, Gail, also a UNC professor, was finishing a PhD degree. Because Gail was studying China, Yale offered us the chance to go to Wuhan, China, in the center of the country, to develop a collaboration. For me, this idea made absolutely no sense. I knew nothing about China. I spoke no Chinese. Actually, I never thought about China for one minute. Nevertheless, for no good reason, I ended up spending a year in China. What happened in China? We learned a lot about Mao and communism and Chinese food. We wrote a book, which we hoped would be a huge blockbuster. Parenthetically, as of this morning, there are exactly 16 copies of our book online used at Amazon.com for 99 cents apiece. You, you, you are all welcome to race out of here and buy these remaining 20-year-old copies. But back to my story, back to my story. We came to Chapel Hill from China, and 10 years later, AIDS was a global epidemic. I was then invited to work on AIDS prevention in Africa, specifically because I had international experience. But Africa, China, maybe it's all the same once you leave Chapel Hill. But, but more, more seriously, it was my random time in China that got me invited to work on AIDS in Africa. And my time in China actually taught me lessons that I could use a decade later. The late Steve Jobs called the phenomenon of the long-term benefits of random decisions as connecting the dots. As he pointed out, you can only connect the dots in your life when you are looking backwards. From this moment forward as you graduate, as you go forward, through your lives, at different moment, in, moments in time, doors will open and doors will close. You have no idea which is the right door, or what will happen on the other side of the door, or where the door will lead. And at the time you choose a door, it may well seem irrational or ill-conceived. I can promise you parents all around you will agonize, agonize about the doors you choose. But there are no wrong doors. There will be an important experience on the other side of each and every door. When the time comes, go through the door. Whatever doors you choose, there will always be great dots to connect as you look backwards through your life. The second lesson I learned was about trust. Please note the letter T. Trust is not much discussed except by politicians who almost never think each other are trustworthy. I could not find much about trust in commencement speeches, although I think I saw trust funds mentioned in a speech from a nearby university. So, so, so why am I so concerned about trust? Why am I so concerned about trust? In 1985, 10% of the people admitted to UNC Hospital, just down the road from here, suffered from AIDS infection. And none, none of these patients survived. This was a terrible time in this town. And AIDS was causing a global pandemic. We needed to stop the spread of AIDS. But to understand how to stop the spread of AIDS, we needed to do research. We needed to be able to grow the virus. We needed to be able to study the virus in a laboratory. And we needed to build a state-of-the-art research lab in Africa where the disease was spreading like wildfire. And here is where I ran into a little problem. I knew I wanted to work on AIDS prevention right then and there, but I did not know how to do any of these things. To make this happen, we developed collaborations with people all over the UNC campus, some of whom are here today, and all over the world. These turned out to be lifelong collaborations and lifelong friendships. Our research team has stayed together for more than 20 years, working tirely, tirelessly on this urgent and stressful and terrible problem. How did we stay together? Because we trusted each other. For sure, my own greatest motivation over all these years was living up to the trust that our research team and our patients placed in me. Now as you go forward in your life, your family, and your friends, and your colleagues, and your bosses. They will want to trust you. They need to trust you. Such trust is incredibly precious. Win their trust and guard it ever so jealously. Let's go to yet another T word, tenacity. To repeat the beginning of my own story, 
Our research team believed that if you treated somebody with HIV infection and they took their pills every day, they would no longer be contagious. In 1999, we set out to prove this idea, 13 years ago. But the work didn't happen overnight. It took us 12 years. We had to convince 4,000 heroic people in nine countries in Asia, Africa, and North and South America to volunteer for a complicated and difficult study. The study ultimately cost $78 million. And we needed to convince six American drug companies to donate more than $20 million worth of free drugs. And during the first 10 years of the study, we made no presentations, nor did we publish any papers. All of you have heard that professors here and everywhere must publish or perish. So given this requirement, this study may not have been the best idea, to be perfectly honest, because it took a long time and there were no reports. But let's fast forward to April of 2011. We got our results. Until that day in April, we had no idea whether this marathon, gigantic study, would have any meaningful results. But that day we learned that our study showed that by treating HIV-infected people, we had stopped stopped HIV transmission about 100% of the time. So the people we treated were no longer infectious. The day we announced the study results, they were reported on the front page of newspapers world, worldwide. The Economist magazine made the results their cover story and declared the end of the AIDS epidemic based on these results. And the journal Science named this work the breakthrough of the year, as noted a, a few minutes ago. This recognition from science requires a metaphor. It was like winning American Idol or dancing with the stars for a scientist, because it just never happens. So what did I learn from all of this? The value of tenacity, tenacity. Tenacity is just as important as brains. The easy things in life are already being done. For the hard things, for the difficult challenges, you will surely need great tenacity. People will tell you, you cannot achieve your goal or that your goal is not worth doing. I certainly heard this over and over again for 13 years. But if you are committed to an idea, you must go forward. Your years, at work were not, your years of work at UNC, this university, were not easy. Today you are graduating from one of the very best universities in the world, quite literally, and with the best basketball team in the known universe, assuming. <laughs> so so with, your, with your graduation today, you've already demonstrated terrific tenacity. You've already proven that you have tenacity. We are here right now to recognize and applaud that tenacity fully realized this afternoon. And now I need to bring up yet another T word, talent. I was incredibly lucky to find a career in which I could use my talents. Each of you has talents, both known and unknown. Now is the moment I would look at the parents and ask them to look at their child because the parents and the families that surround you, they most clearly see the unlimited potential in the people who are graduating here today. That unlimited potential re represents the talents that you all have, both known and unknown. Now, I know some of, the some of these talents already. Among the 2,410 2 students graduating, there are gifted musicians and writers and young scientists. And based on your performances here at UNC, I can absolutely predict that some of you will go on to start great businesses or to cure diseases. And some of you, I know, will devote your lives in service to the poorest and neediest people of the world. Okay, that's fine. But some of you are saying, what is my talent? Darn, I must have missed the class about my talent. Or I tried to sign up for that class, but it was already full. The more confident among you, and there are some, are saying, I know I am talented, but how do I get the chance to use my talent right now? Not to worry. Take chances. Be tenacious, and your talents will triumph. For English majors, that was my alliteration in the speech. So let me again offer my truly heartfelt congratulations to you and your families as you finish your time in Chapel Hill. Now there is inevitably a final and perhaps the most important T word that must be said before you leave here today. This T word requires audience participation of the entire audience. I would ask you, who are you? As you leave here as a, par a proud graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, from Chapel Hill, what will you be called now and forever? Now and forever you will officially be called, and this will require your participation, a tar, let's, let's say tar, Thank you all and have a wonderful life.